Hi, this is the Tropical Tidbit for Friday evening, July 31st. As always, the thoughts in this video are mine alone, and in making decisions, consult the National Hurricane Center and your local weather office for the best information for your specific location. Well, we're still tracking Hurricane Isaias with the core now evidence on satellite imagery to the southwest of the Bahamas. It has come through the Turks and Caicos and just to the southwest of the main island chain during the day today and has gone through quite the structural evolution. When we all woke up this morning, the storm had a circulation that was exposed to the southwest of the thunderstorms due to the westerly shear that it is fighting. But the convection has since now wrapped around and we now have the center actually more toward the east side of the convection, which we can confirm from the recon observations which show the last center fix on the eastern side of this ball of cloud here. And uh, this is a healthy sign for the storm in the sense that having convection on the up shear side, that is the side that's facing the shear that's trying to push it the other way, is something that can allow the storm to fight the shear a little bit better. And for that reason, we've seen this pressure value come down and uh, some of these winds come up just a tad. And so this has strengthened a little bit today. And on radar imagery, we can see what we can't see on satellite imagery, which is the development of an eye in the center. We did not have this this morning, but we have now had that convection wrap around like we just mentioned. And so now we have a ring of rain trying to close off around that eye and develop a closed eye wall. So again, a better organized storm today. And of course, this could have implications down the road for people on Andres Island and Nassau, where uh, there is population that could be affected by the wind core of this as it comes through. And hurricane warnings are, of course, up for all of these islands here in the main chain. Now the question is, can it keep this up and can it strengthen more on its journey through the Bahamas? Well. As we noted, the storm is being impacted by shear, and uh, it might be hard to believe that just from looking at satellite imagery. If we look at the water vapor picture here, you'll see this really nice feathery outflow, cirrus clouds expanding westward, and this really doesn't make it look like there's shear out of this direction. But indeed there is shear, and you can see that because these cirrus clouds only exist at the very top of the troposphere. And if we use a model to see the wind data below what we can see here visually, then what you'll see is that if we go back to where this is this morning, or this afternoon rather, uh, you'll see that the outflow is up here in the upper levels of the atmosphere. Just looking at this column of wind barbs here, ignore everything else on the plot for now. That cirrus that you saw moving toward the west is up here above 200 millibar pressure level. And we have the low level steering flow down at the bottom, pushing the storm toward the west northwest, which is the direction it's moving. But in between the two, we have this southerly or even southwesterly wind. And that's where a lot of the shear is right now. If you just looked at the bottom and the top, the winds are kind of similar, both out of the southeast. But it's this part in the middle that's a problem. And we've talked about the storm being able to fight the shear up at this level, but it really can't do much about the shear at this level. So the mid level flow. Uh, Isaias has no control over that to a certain extent, so it can't, uh, if you will, save itself from the shear. That's going to continue to cause the storm to struggle. And we can see that that shear value here is about 20 to 25 knots on the GFS as of this evening. And that's actually only going to get a little bit worse over the next little while. If we go forward to uh, Saturday afternoon, you see that the wind shear goes up to nearly 30 knots here. And on approach to the Florida coastline, it remains nearly 30 knots. And uh, what this could do is cause the storm to eventually ingest a little bit too much dry air. We see that on the radar picture here, uh, the convection is able to wrap around this evening, which has been an improvement, but there's a lot of dry air lurking on the southwest side, and all it takes is a little too much getting forced into this eye wall that's trying to wrap around, and uh, we'll see a collapse of the central thunderstorms, and the storm could undergo a period of weakening. And this actually may happen several times where the storm takes in a breath of dry air, weakens temporarily, and then rebuilds the eye wall. That could happen over the next 24 to 36 hours. And that'll be, of course, very important for the islands up here in terms of the storm's exact intensity. For now, signs point to it being rather healthy up here. But once the, the shear picks up a little bit more, by the time it gets to Florida, it may be struggling more than it is now in the Bahamas. 
we can see the upper level flow on the GFS uh, when the storm is near uh, the coast of Florida on Saturday evening and again shearing flow out of the west so you can see the shear happening there. We also have this big trough over the Great Plains and this is coming eastward and is going to start steering the storm in this big airstream up the eastern seaboard. And so this is going to eventually curve here toward the right. Now of exactly where it curves toward the right is the big question, not only for Florida, but for points farther north. As far as Florida go goes, we continue to have the theme that weaker storm will go farther west because again, the wind is more out of this direction at the top but it's out of this direction at the bottom. So a stronger storm is taller and feels this westerly flow aloft more. So stronger storm gets pushed offshore, weaker storm gets pushed less and may come inland over Florida. Now, we've also seen a trend toward a slightly stronger ridge in the mid-levels to its northeast. So a lot of runs now are getting the storm closer and the consensus has shifted closer to Florida today compared to yesterday as a general rule. And if we look at, uh, at the age wharf as an example of what the storm could look like near the Florida coastline, this is Sunday morning, 8 a.m., and it's coming north just offshore here on this run. It doesn't quite get onshore. And this is the mid-level humidity showing the moisture and the rainfall that's mostly on the east side because of that shear pushing it there from the west. I just want to show you brief briefly that there is some uncertainty as to how well Isaias will be able to uh, we'll be able to fight the shear and continue to maintain a core structure and strong winds and dangerous hazards. The structure is very different if we look at the last few runs of the model where on some runs it just looks different and is at various strengths. It's weaker on some runs, stronger on others. And I just want to show you that to give you a feel for the sensitivity here. We don't know for sure what the storm will look like when it's near the Florida coastline. What's likely to happen is that the west side will likely be drier and smaller than the east side. But if it's at least close to the coast, if it's close enough to the coast, this wind field is going to intersect the coastline. We're going to have strong winds, dangerous surf. And if any of this rain wraps around to this side, which is happening right now in the Bahamas, you can see the rain on the northwest side. If that's still how it looks, when it's near Florida, even if it's offshore by just a little bit, you can get that dangerous weather and potential for flash flooding intersecting the coast wherever this is as it comes up. So take these tropical storm warnings and hurricane watches seriously. In fact, we actually do have a hurricane warning now for portions of the Florida coastline down here. Those are there for a reason, and we don't know for sure if it's going to be, you know, 50 miles offshore or if it's coming inland. There are models that show it coming inland. This is the morning European model from this morning showing the storm over northern Andres Island tomorrow morning, and then by Sunday morning it's inland near West Palm Beach. So again, uh, no guarantees that this stays offshore and this will be providing strong hazards. Now, as far as points north of Florida go, what happens near Florida is quite important because if it moves over Florida and farther west, it will weaken more because it's over land and then it will also have less time over water in this section of the track before it moves over, say, the Carolinas. That means less time for the storm to get stronger again before moving over the Carolinas. If it's farther offshore, though, like some of the H wharf runs, it might have more of an opportunity over water before moving up into the Carolinas and beyond with which to strengthen during this part of its journey. So a lot of details yet to figure out for everyone up here. At least for Florida, we're pretty confident that there are some factors that will strongly limit Isaias, and we may even see some weakening between uh, the Bahamas and its closest approach to Florida. But that doesn't mean we can't still see dangerous hazards. And this is the current Hurricane Center forecast showing all in red here, hurricane warnings from the Bahamas to the east coast of Florida and tropical storm warnings at the very south of Florida, Lake Okeechobee, and then hurricane watches extending farther up the coast now. And we'll probably see more watches out for Georgia and the Carolinas as we go through tomorrow. So again, with this track expected to be very close to the coast, you know, is it inland? Is it 50 miles offshore? These are details that are, you know, to, at some sense left to randomness in the atmosphere that we just don't know because we don't have enough data about the atmosphere to pin it down further than that. So just be ready just in case this could be a hurricane near the Florida coastline, including winds up to 75 miles per hour or so. And again, regardless of the wind speed, 
the biggest problems are always related to water. High surf, storm surge, water pushed ashore. If you're in a flood zone, you need to know that. If you're vulnerable to inland flooding where heavy rain can cause problems near your home, you need to know that and just be prepared for what kind of hazards you might be vulnerable to. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.